Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? Big P here. You know, don't you? You know. And we're welcoming a special guest, a good friend of mine, Terry from uh, London. The trainer at Fitzroy Lodge and a banker in the city. How are you doing, Terry? The last bit might not be true. We just we're just saying that for effect. But now I feel good. I feel I feel extra hardcore today, Porks, because I am actually in my mum's house while we record oh, yeah. this. So so it's official. Yeah, I'm allowed to say anything I want now because I'm in my mum's house. Right then, uh, straight into it then. No messing about. Rick Top's show last night at BT Studios. What do you think to it? So it's always a tricky one, Russ. So what do you do, right? Ed, Ed, Eddie, Eddie has his finale the week before. So you've got two options. You either try and top that, which means you've got to come up with a pay-per-view event, or you just sandbag it and you go, well, I'll just get a show in there that just gets us over the line, right? I yeah. think that's what Frank did. He just gave us a sandbag show. And it was just one of those where it was like, we just want to have the last word. We don't want to spend a lot of money, but we just want to have the last word over this whole lockdown thing. Yeah. So I think Frank was smart because he had the first word and the last word. And so, you know, we're going to be talking about Frank's guys, not Eddie's guys. Do you see what I mean? I think he's been pretty clever in that. Yeah. Uh, there were six fights on, and obviously he had six last time, and the all, all home fighters won last time. And this time, all the home fighters won. It's... Uh, it's the housewife's bet, isn't it? A bit like Lester Piggy in the day, isn't it, at the moment? The accumulator. <laughs> uh, I always tell people, look, if you want a safe bet, just go for an accumulator on any of Frank or Eddie's shows. Now, we'll go through the fights. You know I'm a stat man, don't you? But David Adelaide, uh, you know David. I've spent a lot of time with David. Uh, I did two camps with him when I was with Peter. And David is flying high. He's just beat a guy ranked 464, but he's allowed them fights, isn't he? Terry. Oh, hang on. You there, Terry? Russ, sorry about that. My my Bluetooth was acting up. Sorry, uh, David Adderley, we've both, you know David and I know David. Yeah. Nice enough kid. He's got a degree in that. He's he's very polite. I've seen him spar loads of rounds with Yui and other people up at Peter's gym. Uh, I rate him. He's very quick, very powerful. But he fought a guy that Williams ranked 464. But David's allowed that sort of fight. Do you agree? No, wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. You've got to understand who Phil Williams is, right? Yeah. Phil's ranking doesn't reflect who Phil is. Like, if yeah. Phil wanted to go after people, he could. He's hard as nails. Like, he's almost impossible to stop in a four rounder. Yeah. So, the fact that David was able to stop him is a massive tick in the box. So, yeah. w when you see that, you're like, okay, he's better than just being a, an area level fire. Right? That's what you know for certain. You're like, okay, he's better than area level. He's somewhere between English and British level, just based on what I saw yesterday. Yeah. And I would have no issue putting him in with the Dave Allen. I was like a 10 rounder with Dave Allen, I have no issue with that. And what I, you know what I, like, what I really like about him, Russ? Yeah. He's not obsessed with the sweet science. He's not trying to be technically perfect. He's just in there to get rid of you. And I love that. Yeah. Right, Joey. He wants to get people out of there, doesn't he? All right. Then. I so thought you were going to manage him. But I always, there was a certain point where I was like, Russ might end up managing this kid. Well, I were working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, wait, no, got him, I got him and Dennis together, didn't I? Uh, but uh, I think he, he's, I think he'd already made his mind up that he were going to do another eighteen months and finish his degree, and and uh, go and to, then look to turn pro. And to be fair to him, he, he didn't rush. He waited. He was getting offers from everywhere. I mean. Once you've gone and sparred people who were fighting for a world title, who fought for a world title, and you, you sparred David Day and stuff like that, you know how the word spreads, don't you, in boxing, Terry? You know, it's... He, yeah, and, and you've got to remember, he did this off, like, no real amateur pedigree. There's no there's no one you can say he beat in the amateurs. So but he's done this to him, he's a natural af athlete. I think he could probably could have done rugby, football, boxing. He's another Joshua, but I think he's probably going to have a good career, mate. 
but he's a nice yeah, guy. But, I like him. He's a little bit undersized, so I want to see him against some bigger guys and just to see how he copes. I don't think he can do cruise weight though. No, no, but he's going to be one of those kind of her behind guys where he's about 15, yeah. 15, 10. Yeah. Well, maybe I didn't do too bad, did he? Double champ, double two time world heavyweight champion. Yeah, but that was when the WBO was kind of like, we just need a world title. It's when the WBO was like the WBF is now. No, IBO. <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe. All right. Uh, moving on from David, then we wish him well. Noakes, he stopped Ellinson, who were ranked 501. So, Sam Noakes was trained by my friend Eddie Lamb. So, I've got a bit of bias and I want to see Eddie do well. I think Eddie, Eddie yeah. and Al Smith are in boxing, there are a few legit good guys. Eddie Lamb's one of the really good guys in the sport, Al Smith is another one of the really good guys in the sport. And so, I'm really happy for them. Sam Noakes, strong. Now, I don't know if anyone follows him on Instagram. The kid's squatting 120 kilos and whatnot. He's really, really strong. And that's what he, that's what he takes into the fight with him, is just, you know, that, that strength and power. Yeah. And so that was, that was kind of on display today. But you still, these are kids, you want to see them tested against someone who, who isn't going to fall over, who isn't going to quit on them, who's going to take them the rounds. Because you can, you can be strong, you can be fast, you can be all of these things, Russ. Yeah. But have you got the heart to, to grit out a result. And we want to find this out in our prospects as early as possible. Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, Willie Hutchinson beat a guy ranked 446. Thomas, what do you think to that fight? Obviously, he iced him in a round, didn't he? Ah, there you go. That's just one of those where, like I said, you just want to have the last word on your, on your show, don't you? So Hutchinson just got a little, little fight for some holiday money. There's not much to say about that one, to be honest. Yeah, rumour going round that Matt Schumer sniffing around Willie Hutchinson. That's the word doing the rounds, the camp rounds, the round the campfire. What do you think? So who's he, tra- who, who's he trained by at the moment? I think, is it Dominic Ingo? So you can see why Dom would rather have all of his guys with Eddie. Just for, you know, for just logistics, to be honest with you. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and he's talented. He's, he's super talented. Could he do 168? Probably. Could he do 175? Yeah, he does that. He started so, so with Willie, David A, didn't he? Say again? Started with David A, didn't he? Yeah, he was, he was one of the, like, he was him, Kesh Ashback, Michael Venom Page, Joe Joyce, and I'm sure I've missed someone out. Yeah, the, the days when... Richard when I was meant to be one. Yeah, no, no, well, I was meant to be one of the, one of the faces of Haymaker. Like, I'd signed all the paperwork and stuff. And then, God knows what happened. <laughs> oh, Terry. Uh, right then, Sam Maxwell, we like him, don't we? Against Joe Hughes. Now, that were a competitive fight, I think, do you? That was a good fight. Um, really, really enjoyed Maxwell. Love combination punches. And Maxwell's a guy that will he'll hit you with three or four shots. And what I like is he can punch on the move as well. So there were a couple of times where you were watching him and Joe Hughes. And Hughes would take a couple of steps back. And Maxwell would follow him, but unlike most people who, who need to plant their feet, Maxwell just kept peppering him with shots. And I'm not going to say Maxwell is the guy at 140. I think he'd give people problems because he's super skilled. Yeah. You only have to go back to see he gave Lomachenko the most trouble in the World Boxing Super, uh, the World Series of Boxing in the amateurs. Yeah. And I liked him. He's a really intelligent boxer, but he might be slightly underpowered in the pros. But I'd like to see him in with a guy like Robbie Davis Jr. You could put him in with a Ritson, but you know, will those fights ever happen? I don't know. But that's really where I can see him. Or even whack him in with an O'Hara Davis. Yeah, yeah, that's a good fight, that. So Sam Maxwell onwards and upwards. Yeah, yeah I'm happy for him. Right then. Then we come to Mr. To- Mr. Controversial. Uh, against a guy that I've actually uh, met. I'll tell you a little story about Thomas Asomba. He, uh, Dennis put a show on with Phil Jeffries. Uh-huh. Uh, we know contract. And uh, I've not been with Dennis long. And, uh, and I said, how come there's no contract then? Because he, obviously I was there to learn off him. And he said, oh, he's a big pal of mine, Jaffa. So anyway, Jaffa, Jaffa and Sean, this bearded guy, the trainer, uh, Thomas Asomba, 
Roll into Sheffield. <laughs> Ice Dennis's guy took had a bet with Dennis and drove off, but before they drove off, they gave me and my mate a lift. <laughs> On oh, the Range Rover. In the Range Rover at 110 mile an hour down at a cliff. This is from Hotel Tip Fight. And uh, I thought, oh my God, we're going to die here. Phil Jeffries, I'm going to die in the back of Phil Jeffries as Range Rover Vogue. And I thought, what's going on here anyway? We got into the arena and he iced Dennis's guy and they shot off, didn't come to after party at all. But he was sat next to me in Range Rover, that Thomas, a somber. He never batted an eyelid. And I got talking. So, so I'll give you an interesting Thomas, a somber story. So about eight years ago, he, he hit the buzzer. Well, I don't know if it was him or if it was Christian. They hit the buzzer and we've got like five, five black lads coming to our gym. Uh, Didn't they defect the from their country, Terry? Yeah, they basically absconded from the from the from the training village. They went the to the Olympics, village. didn't they, in London? They were in the Olympics, yeah. Yeah, they were in so, the Olympic village and they did a runner, didn't they, after the fights? Yeah. So so Thomas came and we're like and so they came, they had their kits on, right? And we're like, have you just come from the Olympics? And like, yeah, yeah. So it's a mixture of really bad English and really bad French. Yeah. And so we had them because they were allowed to stay in the country till I think like the middle of November 2012. So we had these lads in the gym from August to November 2012. And like, we were trying to get the, the asylum, oh, sorry again, we were trying to get the asylum thing sorted because we wanted them to stay down south, to be honest with you, and carry on training and we were getting MPs involved and stuff. And then the problem is, and this is boxing for you, everyone saw a few quid in these kids because they were good. So Thomas Osomba was brilliant. He, what were the he other kids with him? I've heard of him. What were the other kid? There were loads. So there's, oh, what there's, was Sir John Bomber? Serge was there. Sir, um, so he lives over here now. No, sorry. Do you want to tell the story? No, sorry. Go on. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> so, so we got all these lawyers involved. But what happened was, because these guys were basically putting, they were, they were basically splattering people in London, sparring-wise, right? And so the rumour gets out that they're these Cameroonian kids who are absolutely brilliant. And so all these other people in boxes start sticking their nose in. And so they get taken away from us. God knows how and why. And so I lost touch with, with Thomas and Serge for about two years. And then it turned out Serge ended up in Sheffield. He struggled a bit. Thomas ended up like up north. Middlesbrough struggled a bit. Uh, Blaze ended up in Manchester and he struggled a bit. And I always regret that because had those guys stuck together, Porky, they would have they would have taken a lot of reputations because Jesus could they fight. Jesus. Whew. They're just washed up now, though, isn't it? No, 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 no. He, he knows his role. Serge knows his role. So you can get Serge to do anything from 147 to 160. And yeah, but the, the tips, though, wanted to do well and it sort of hadn't worked out for him. I, I suppose adjusting to another country when you're coming from, where are they from? Is it Cameroon. You, Cameroon, yeah. When you're coming from places like that to over, over here, it's uh, it must they, be. They I, struggle. I would yeah, they, they... Cameroon. I won't be able to adjust over there, mate. Uh, well, you definitely wouldn't be able to keep your gold chain. That's for sure. <laughs> I don't know where my chain is. <laughs> In Cameroon, that would took off me, would it? Ah, easily. <laughs> Do you know what? It's it, it's like it's like Congo. There are people in that country you don't believe in human, like in terms of just strength, yeah. speed, power. It's that. Nah, like, I remember, I remember I used to spar Blaze Mendo, and you'd hit him with everything you had, like crack, and he'd go harder. And you're like, crack, and his head wouldn't even move. Like, what was it? He's like 106 kilos, not much body fat, just immovable. Well, that's what, what all the eat over there is mashed taties, isn't it? No, oh, they, 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 they don't have a lot they, of they, they, like we eat, do they? No, no, of course not. But that's that's that. They're just also just freaks, man. They they are just freaks. Like Thomas Osomba, we lost the two best years of his career when he was in in detention. Like him in those two years would have battered Sonny Edwards from pillar to post. What do you mean? What, what do you mean? Like quarantine? You, when you, no, so when you apply for asylum, like because they don't want you to work or to run away or to do anything, they put you in like a holding camp. 
And so you've got to be there for two years while they process your claim. Yeah. Oh, that's, I, I didn't know that. So, so Jaffa must have waited then for all that to go through and then signed him then. Yeah, well, he couldn't do it before. So they had to wait till they were given asylum. And then once the paperwork came through, everyone just started. It was a, it was a free-for-all. It was, and it was so sad because they, they should have kept them all together. I think they would have been stronger together. Yeah. All right, then. Moving on, then. So, Tom, oh, sorry. Thomas Asomba, he got beat on points by Sonny Edwards. Did you think it was a competitive fight, Terry? Nah, nah look, at that sort of weight, um, like, what's it, 115 pounds, 32 years old. You, you, you're like five years too old at that, at that point. So yeah. Thomas was just kind of there to get a paycheck and he had to lose to, to Bugs Bunny, unfortunately. Yeah. So. I know. Sonny Edwards is... is uh, people are comparing him to being the new Paul Smith on Twitter, aren't they? People keep saying to me. He's starting yeah, he's, to get up people's noses, isn't he? He's, he, look, he's just Bugs Bunny. He's a little teacup dog, whatever you want to call him, man. He's just one of these guys who's got a big mouth, but he bought about, about 10,000 of his followers. So the, the thing is, you can't even get into a Twitter war with him because no one reads his, his, his tweets. So he's just a waste of time, to be honest with you. Yeah. All right, then. Well, let's hope that when he fights Tommy Frank, he gets iced. Right, then. Moving on to the main event. Oh, Tom, oh sorry. Thomas Asomba. Box rec 39, highest ranked opponent on box rec yesterday. Right, Snyder, ranked 173. He was fed to Dubois, and it looked like a blown up light anyway, in with a super heavyweight, didn't it? Mm, yes, but also give Dubois credit because what he actually hurt him with wasn't power shots to the head. It was it was a beautiful hook to the body. So yeah. so actually, I what I enjoyed about that fight was people got to see that. Daniel Dubois can actually put shots together. That's yeah. what's quite scary about him. I, don't, I think, had that been Dillian in that fight, it would have just been heavy leather to the head until the guy fell over. Same with Joshua. But Dubois just picked him apart and said, oh, I'm going to hurt you there. I'm going to hurt you here. It was just all accurate and all merciless. And I, I quite like to see that because it lets people know Joe Joyce better be doing those sit-ups I mean, and those, those crunches because There'll be some heavy body shots coming in. Yeah. Uh, what do you think that they just got Daniel Dubar out to give him a run out, Terry? Or what? What do you What do you think? What do you think the story? What with that yesterday? Because he's probably had harder spars than that, any Dubar. Okay, so if you remember, the original plan was still to do the the Joyce Dubois fight in July, and it was only very late in the process they said, okay, no. We're going to split these two up. We're going to put Joyce in with whoever. And we're going to put Dubai in with, I think it was Eric Pfeffer, who was a decent amateur, actually. And he boxed a friend of mine in the amateurs. So he's, he's, he's good enough to present a challenge. But then that guy dropped out for whatever reason. So they had two weeks to find an opponent, Russ. And that's what they found. Because you have to remember, people are either going to charge you too much or you're going to get someone who's almost too good. And they might drag Daniel into a war and risk the October fight with Joe Joyce. So you had to kind of tread that fine line between, you know, what's available and what you can put on TV. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was like, look, if you look at the show, you could say they're all mixed matches. And really, they were all one, weren't they, apart from one, if you know what I mean, weren't they, really? Yeah. They had to get, they had to get some out, didn't they? Because obviously... They've got, they want to keep BT happy and blah de blah, but the point I want to make is that I think we've got to put better shows on than this. But all the big guys are all they're all holding out for more money, aren't they? I suppose. Okay, well, uh, quick question: How many Dennis Hobson shows have you done now? You know, but since I started with Dennis, thirty odd, yeah. thirty eight or so. Yeah. Yeah. So if I ask you, how many of those fights? happened on fight night the way you imagined them in your head? Like, when you drew up the original list of fights, how many of those original lists ended up Eight being on fight night? Out of every show, say, for instance, Dennis put seven fights on, you could usually pick six out of the seven, I suppose. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but, but I think my point is, like, you might say, look, we're going to put Tommy Frank in against this guy, right? 
And then two weeks later, that guy's been, he's either charging too much, he can't be bothered to cut weight, and you're like, okay, we need someone else in. And you might get to number three or four down that list for Tommy Frank. And then all of a sudden, a card that looked good on paper is now, it's just average, isn't it? Because people have either priced themselves out, they're not in shape, they can't be bothered to go to Sheffield, and all this sort of stuff. I think that's what makes it hard to, to put these shows together. To, be, to give Dennis his credit, right, everything always used to fall apart in fight week, but he never, he never once flapped. Whereas I've been, I've, I've been to other shows with Dennis. You know Nick Manners, who's, who's, uh, who works with Josh Wallet and he's got a gym in Leeds, hasn't he? Four. Yeah, he's got one next to his brother. Like, like him and his yeah, yeah. brother have gyms next to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, Rick, his brother, he put a show on, and uh, we we went over there and. He, he, he was he there, Terry. Where's he gone? Oh, let me just have you back in. You there, Terry? There's yeah, some Bluetooth issues. Sorry, uh, his brother put a show on and he, he, he was flapping, he was running around in a, in a right tail spin. And I, and I think it, I don't think he'd put many on a couple or something. And it's a lot to take on because a lot of people do it, and they've not got the capital. But if it, if they lose, that they're like putting everything into the show. And, and to be fair to him, he got through the night. But mistakes were made, and one of them was one of Dennis's fights that got paid twice. I'm not going to say who it were. You know who it were. He got paid off <laughs> Rick, and he got paid off off. Uh, Somebody else on that. He had two two purses and did one. Never fought again. <laughs> but mistakes happen. You. This is why you have to keep your wits about wits about you. But uh, and I felt sorry for him actually because I've heard both sides of the story, and uh, I've basically sided with Rick Manners because you know what I'm like. <laughs> Which went down like a lead balloon, but I. I can see where Dennis is coming from, but if one of Dennis's fighters gets paid twice, it should be up to Dennis to say to the fighter, Oi, you little so and so, give them their money. You've been paid twice, you, you little yeah. FDKER. And that didn't happen. So I, re I kind of felt for Rick Manners. But yeah. fight week, sh shows fall apart because people agree to fight your fighters, but then. The big boys, you Eddie Earns and Frank Warrens, then have a way with them managers and says, I'll pull out of that show and it'll piss Dennis off. And that's what happens in fight week. This is why you have to have plan Bs. And, and, and when you've got television, it can cause major problems. It's all right for small people, like, you know, your little SMO small ones, like Steffi Bull and Carl Greaves. They haven't got TV, have they? So they don't have people being pulled off their shows. But if you've got TV... The other big boys want to disrupt your shows, but I never saw Dennis flap once. Even when I've been screaming and ranting off, he just used to sit there cool as a cucumber and say, calm down. Whereas other people would be wringing my neck because I do lose my head down a few times. But he never, flapped. <laughs> he never flapped once, Dennis, you know. And it's every show, every single show. And they're all there on Box if you look. Every single show, there were always problems. AJ Hobson, he never used to flap either in fight week when there were problems. It, they, they just used to keep the cool. But I suppose having a few quid helps, doesn't it? But if, yeah. you, if people were taking liberties, I, will, I won't be able to control myself. I won't. Cause... But you, we talk about this every week, Russ, don't we? Boxing is this game where you can never lose sight of the big picture. Like, Fight week is just one small episode in a far bigger story, and you have to always retain control of that story, or you'll lose your head. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, I suppose. But overall then, going back to Frank's show, I'm going to give it a six and a half, right? I think it were all mismatches, but what, what else can he do in this time? But I don't want to hear from people saying, well, it's best we can do because really it isn't. They can do better than this. Frank's just had two shows, and how many competitive fights have we seen in his last two shows? One, isn't it, really? Uh, what was the show before this one? Dennis McCann's show, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, but if you look at where... So Frank and Eddie are at different stages, right, of development. 
Frank's got to give us these shows because Frank's building guys for the next the next three year cycle. That's why I find it really interesting. It's almost like he's using BT's capital to build up a stable of stars that he can then take to Sky. That's what it looks like to you. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm going to take Dubois. I'm going to take Yard. I'm going to take Adelaide. I'm going to take McCann. Uh, I'm going to take Willie Hutchinson. I mean, they're, they're, they're five guys, I think, could hang at world level over time. Yard. Five guys already. Oh, yeah. Put Yard in there. Six. That's... That's a stronger stable in terms of like world level Joe potential. Joyce. That's a stronger stable. Joe Joyce. Ah, he, he'll always be that kind of British European guy for me. World level. But you see the point though, Russ, right? You're, Frank's building this and he's saying, because he wants to be able to say this time next year or just before this time next year, Sky, write down your top 10 matchroom fighters. I'll write down my top 10 fighters. If you genuinely believe this matchroom 10 beats this Queensbury 10, cool. But I don't think you do, or you would have made the fights already. Therefore, you may as well sign me because I've got the better stable. I can see that being the discussion that's going to start happening soon. All right, then. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Right, then. Moving on. Uh, Steve Lillis, who I like a lot. Uh, he's been around boxing game years. Sadly, he's a Fulham fan. But... I'm not going to hold that against him. Steve Lillis put a tweet out, somebody sent me, and it said he were going on about the view, the views that BT did last night, and they did good numbers, didn't they? Yeah. Well, I imagine they did, yeah. And he earned, decided to reply to it, and uh, and he put the, 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 the peak thing was between 7 p.m. and 5 past 7. Well, it's backfired on Eddie because it didn't start well at half seven. <laughs> but why, why would Eddie Hearn on a Sunday want to jump on a tweet that Steve Lillis has said and put their numbers down uh, with a lie, a blatant lie? Why would he do that on a Sunday when he's supposed to be spending time with his family? Look, it's that game, isn't it? Hearn knows he can just own the story. That's it. That's all that matters with Hearn. Hearn just, he doesn't even care what the story is, Russ. As long as he can own the story, he doesn't care. Do you that's think, the whole... That's, yeah, yeah, I agree. Do you think that Eddie's now trying to create a bit of raw, intense beef between him and Frank so he can say, look, I can't work with these because he doesn't want to throw him a bone? Because Frank wants to work with him and it probably hurt Frank to go cap in hand to Eddie. But it's, they keep saying it's for fans, and Eddie says that, but it looks to me like it's all prolonged rubbish. You said two years ago that you didn't see Joshua Fury happening until 2022, didn't you? Well, 2021's nearly upon us, and it doesn't look like they're any closer, does it? No. 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 I, 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 remember, and I remember the reason I gave you at the time, Russ. I said, once that big fight's done, Boxing's finished for another five years. It's just finished. Because we haven't got that, that international star. Normally, the Olympics will give us that, right? But the 2016 standout guy was Tony Yoka. Tony Yoka refuses to learn a lick of English. So, you know, we can't relate to him. And then outside of that, the silver medalist was Joe Joyce. And he's damn near 50. So it's almost like, well, what have we got to look forward to? Not that much is the answer. Like, Dubois... But by the time Dubois gets to the top, it'll be a pretty dead division anyway. So I don't, I don't even... There's not much to get excited by. And that's why I always thought they'd drag out Fury v. Joshua till they were like, okay, you know, Joshua's had enough beatings. He's kind of on his last leg. He can't do these training camps anymore. His muscles are broken. His bones are broken. Let's just get him that fight with Fury now. Let's all just cash out. And I can see that happening still in 2022. Yeah, uh, what did you think to this narrative that Darren Barker, Spencer Oliver, Tony Bell, you Adam Smith, Johnny Nelson, all the rest of the Sky people, everybody else who want to get in bed with Sky, uh, what do you think to this narrative that Dillian White's been mandatory a thousand di- days when technically a thousand days ago it was WBC number three? What do you think to that? <laughs> I think that's just who was, a, who, who was above him? Who was above him in the rankings? Uh, two seconds, I'll read it out to you. 
1,000, which 1,002 days ago now, Bermain's to be was, was number one, uh, Wilder beat him twice. Ortiz were number two, Wilder beat him twice. Dillian yeah. White, number three, he were offered the fight, he knocked it back, didn't he? But that was before he were mandatory. Uh, and going through this top top here, so Wilder's had two, four. Is he beat Brazil? That's he was number six. Yeah. He's done him. Uh, yeah. Who else has he done? Has he done Du Hoopus? Yep. So that's two, four, four. That's six out of the top ten. He's not done Rivers, has he? He's done Molina, hasn't he? Yep. So that's seven. Uh, has he done Kaunaki now? No, no, they were setting that up, weren't they, until he lost. So he's done seven. He's had seven wins out of the top 15. But yet, Tony Bellew's put a tweet out saying it's a joke. Dillian White's waited a thousand days, mandatory. So that's a lie because he was number three a thousand days ago. And also, Bellew says for the last 18, sorry, for the last 800 days, while there's been fighting cab drivers, when technically I went back 1500 days to prove the point. And Wilder's fought a great set of, of fights, hasn't he, in his last eight fights. So, Tony Bellew, what, what do you think to the lies that he's put out? Are they putting these lies out because they've got the big platforms, Terry, and that everybody buys into it who's macho FC? Look, most people who buy into boxing, it's only on the surface level. So, they'll just believe what they're told because they don't really care that much is the truth. They don't give a monkeys. It's like, okay, who's a good guy? Who's a bad guy? I need to figure this out in about 20 seconds. And Hearn's mastered this. So Hearn does that. He tells you he's the good guy and he tells you Frank's the bad guy. And so it's easy. So Bellew just jumps in and says that. But what they don't say is, they don't say Dillian's waited a thousand days for a world title fight because that's not true. He's been offered world title fights and he's turned them down. But they don't want to talk about that. Remember, Russ, you and I talked ages ago. And I said to you, this is just a money grab. Dillian doesn't necessarily want a world title. He wants a big money fight. He wants that Joshua money type fight. That's what he really wants. Because he's got backers. And those backers expect to get a return on their investment. And making a million and a half here, two million there, isn't cutting it at the moment. That's the reality of Dillian's situation. He needs bigger purses. But for those bigger purses, he needs a belt. But what about the fight you knocked back at Wembley for four belts against Joshua in a rematch? And they both had, they've already had two fights, amateur and pro. There's beef there, intense beef, or is it sexy spam, laughing lobster, funny pheasant, whatever they want to call it. So there's beef there, and he's knocked it back. Guaranteed five million, rising up to six million on upside, depending on pay per view and gate money. So why would Dillian knock a guaranteed five and a possible six million back? To let no, he didn't want the rematch clause. See, no, no, but it comes back to the point. He didn't want the rematch clause because the rematch clause would have still given him rubbish money. So he wanted to say, look, let me beat Joshua. And then after that, I can make the eight-figure salary. I can make the eight-figure person, sorry. That was all. This is... When boxing fans stop thinking this is about sport and they accept that this is really about business, they'll free themselves from a lot of pain. It's better to wait two years to earn 15 million than it is to fight three times for three million right that's just the reality of how boxing works so people sit it out they'll wait and that's what dillian has been doing he was sat there he's like okay i'm gonna wait i'm gonna wait for the wilder fight because i know i make good money on that or i'm gonna wait for the fury fight because i can make good money on that now as things stand he doesn't get to fight either of those guys yeah and he has to fight Povetkin again and if he loses to Povetkin. He's back fighting guys like Chisora and Takam, which isn't good money. So he needs to get in a position where he can fight the Joshuas, the Furies and the Wilders. Yeah. That's where he needs to get to. And I think if he loses again, he's at least two years off that. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, so what a mistake for Dylan White to knock the Joshua fight back at Wembley, the rematch. Well, look at what Ruiz did. I'd say it was. He must be kicking himself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, couldn't Dillian have fought Joshua, beat him, and then renegotiated like Ruiz did with Eddie Hearn? Nah, well, so you have to... So here, here's what happened with Team Ruiz, I think, for the rematch. 
the message went back and it was very simple. We will do the rematch with Anthony Joshua, but we'll vacate a couple of these titles because we've got PBC guys who are quite highly ranked that could fight for these titles. So the contract doesn't say I'm prohibited from vacating the titles. I'm allowed to do anything I want. It just says I have to fight Joshua again. So they had to sweeten up the deal so that he kept all the belts. Yeah, it's uh, a tricky situation. And Dylan White, obviously, now he's in a bit of a pickle, isn't he? Mm, well, he's got, to, he's got to fight Povetkin. And if he doesn't get to fight Povetkin because Povetkin maybe retires, for example, then, geez, then you've got to crawl your way up from the bottom. All right, then. So what do you think to the situation where Dylan White... Is going to fight Povetkin. They're saying now, aren't they? The last Saturday in November. Now, I'm not sure what date that's on. But I don't think Povetkin won't agree to that at all. Yeah, no, but this is what Eddie's saying. Is that is he paying? Is he paying Dylan lip service just to keep him sweet and ticking over? Povetkin won't agree to that. Povetkin is not stupid. He knows he's going to have to take at least six weeks off. He's he's forty. He'll be forty-one in three days. Yeah. So he's going to have to take about six weeks off. Let the body heal. And then he's going to have to get into camp for eight weeks. That's about 14 to 15 weeks away. And that's, yeah. it feels very much like early 2021 for me when that rematch happens. All right, then, Terry. Do you, do you think that Dylan White, uh, saying that he's learning on the job, Bellew saying he's learning on the job, Barker, Spencer Oliver, oldest guy, yes, man, saying he's learning on the job is out of order, considering... He's got a British title at home uh, that he won against Ian Lewinson that were vacant. And he's w he was WBC number one ranked. And he's looking towards his sixth pay-per-view with Povetkin. Six. Do you think that this sixth pay-per-view will now expose him as somebody that just wants to fight for money and not legacy? Uh, it's a tricky one, Russ. Because sometimes I don't think the fighter necessarily makes the decision. Like I've always said, you take the top 10 heavyweights, put them in a room, they'll be scrapping. Inside of 10 minutes, they'll be scrapping. Because that's where you need to be in order to be that good. Yeah. So there are people behind the scenes. Do you remember those, Hearn had that interview? And I remember, it might have been on the Boxing Voice, and he was like, I own Anthony Joshua. I own his promotional rights. No one can sign anything without running it past me first. Who said that? And that um, Eddie Hearn did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did, yeah. Yeah. So when you've got people with that mindset, that kind of slave owner mindset, it's very hard to make fights happen because they're thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about legacy. They're not thinking about what the fans want. They're thinking about themselves. And so Dillian also has people backing him who have put money into him and they want to see a return. So they're saying certain fights can happen. Or certain fights can't happen depending on the money, and so that's why you don't see a lot of these things happening. Like Dillian will fight Dubois tomorrow. If you said to Dill, you could make ten million fighting Dubois tomorrow, he'd take it. But his handlers might say, "No, no, we don't want that fight. That's too much risk. Why don't we fight Joshua for fifteen or twenty, and we're not going to take as much of a beating, and we want more chance of winning." And so these are the silly games people are playing. Like I said, when you see more of a business, more. And you see it as more of a business, then you free your mind up from all the pain and the frustration. Do you think that Eddie Earns had an input in Dave Colwell being slipped in with Dylan White in, in the team? Do you, think, do you think that undermines Miller? And do you think Miller's now being pushed out because Colwell's now doing interviews on social media with Dean White on Zoom and other YouTubers? And that Miller's nowhere to be seen. Do you see Dave Colwell having a prominent role in that camp? So I think it's, it's worth cleaning up Xavier Miller. Xavier Miller's a talented young coach. He's, you know, he's done a lot of great work in the community for me. Like, I mean, he's a guy that trains amateurs and pros. So for me, you know, he's, he's one of the good guys, and I like people who do that. He's talented, but he's new to all of this. He's not a, he's not a guy that's done world-level stuff for five or ten years. And so what I've learned is... It takes you about 10 years of, of training people and working up that ladder to be comfortable at world level. Because 
when you start boxing the best guys from anywhere in the world, you've got to be able to understand tactics. You've got to understand what's going on in that situation. And you need experienced eyes for that. I don't even think Caldwell's that good at it, to be honest with you. That's why you need someone like a Jimmy Tibbs. Yeah. And it's no coincidence that Shane McGuigan will always get Jimmy Tibbs in his corner. Yeah. Yeah. He don't, and there's such change. McGuigan's number one trainer in England at the moment, don't they? Yeah. But it's the things Jimmy will see that you won't even think about. He'll just, he'll just spot something. And you go, oh, okay. I'll, if I hadn't seen that, I wouldn't know what to do. And so that experience is priceless. That's why I'm a big Jimmy Tibbs fan. Because you need those old war horses who have seen every trick, every yeah. tactic ever. Do you think it was a mistake, uh, Dillian White and Mark, Mark, getting rid of Mark Tibbs? Um, yes and no. So I like Mark. You know, Mark, Mark, Mark genuinely looks like he was in a boy band in like 1989, doesn't he? You know, he looks like one of those, like he could have been in Bros. But he, Mark's a good guy in the times I've been Mark in Bros. He could have been. He, he, he looks like it, though. Instead of Craig Logan. <laughs> uh, maybe he's a better singer than Craig. But no, I like Mark. I think Mark's good. I think Mark knows his stuff. But also remember, Porky, there was someone before Mark Tibbs. There was Chris Oko. So do I think Chris Oko was hard done by in, when Mark Tibbs took over? Do you see what I mean? Where yeah. do you draw the line? All right, then. Uh, how, you, how you get him is how you lose him, Russ. Yeah. 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 Do you think that uh, Dave Caldwell's CV justifies him jumping in with these guys that are already ready-made, you know, like Bellew, David Price, Dylan White, Chisora? Do you think it... And, and what do you think is Dave Caldwell's best win as a trainer? Do you think it's the Jamie McDonald one? Because he was already a world champion when he got in, wasn't he? When they went to uh, America twice, Texas. Do you think they're his best two wins as a trainer? Dave Caldwell's not even the best trainer to have come out of that Ingle thing. Man. Like, Chris Smedley's a better trainer than Dave Caldwell. Fact. Now, is Dave a better social worker? A guy who's better at raising morale and making you feel good about yourself? Maybe. Maybe that's his thing. He just makes you feel so good, you fight well. But he's not a technician, he's not a technician. So you think he's basically blagged it and he's a confidence trickster and obviously he's got Eddie Earns here and he's playing... No, no, whoa, 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 whoa. They're your words, Porky, right? They're not my words. I'm asking you. I don't, I don't think, yeah, I don't think he's a trickster because there's value in that. Like, we all want, we all want to feel good about ourselves. And yeah. when we feel good, we train good, we fight good. So I think there's value in that. I don't think... I don't think he manipulates people. I think he just says, look, I'm Dave Caldwell. This is what I do. Yeah. If you need references, you know who you can go and talk to. Yeah. And then everyone has a choice about whether they sign with Caldwell or not. Do you think so, the jury will be out on him until Opie Price and Jordan Gill uh, for a high level? Well, listen, if he turns Opie Price into a world champion, then we've got to, we've got to like, rate what he's about. Yeah. 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 But until he does that, until we see him, because, you know, this is what he was meant to do with Jerome Wilson, you know, get well soon and all that. I feel for Jerome, I've got a lot of time for him. But this is what he was meant to do with Jerome Wilson and all the other kids that he took when the gym split up back in, like, was it 2000? Yeah. I don't know what year it was, 04 or something. Not, when him and Chris Smedley split up. Yeah. They both took five fighters each, didn't they? Yeah, and Chris had like four ABA champions, and Dave and had none. Cameron ended up IBF number twelve Commonwealth champion, didn't he? And Dave, uh, Dave's five, he didn't do it, did he? He got Jerome bashed up, didn't he? Ah oh, man, I just yeah, I think Sm people don't put enough respect on Smedley's name. Yeah, because Chris doesn't play the social media game, and he's not a kiss ass. A bit like Mick Whale, they don't. They don't, they, don't, they don't get involved in all that bullshit. They're just boxing men, aren't they? Whereas a lot of people, they're more interested in the razzmatazz and being a, being a face and all that, aren't they? And being in with the in crowd. Do you think that has a lot to do with why fighters go with certain trainers? Uh, you know what, Russ? I was talking about this today. Um, hold on. Bear, bear. I hope he doesn't cut my earpieces falling out, so I'm trying not to disrupt the call. Ah, oh, there we go. So I was talking to a couple of fighters over the weekend. I was talking to one today and I was saying, and I was trying to explain to them, when you pick a trainer, you want someone that's going to equip you to win a world title. 
reputations, profiles, all that stuff is irrelevant. Are they going to give you the skills and the experience to be a world champion? Yes or no. Yeah. That's all that matters. All right, then. Moving on, then, from Penfold and uh, the adventures of uh, Dylan White. What do you think to Dominic Ingle's <laughs> song, uh, Looking for Fast Car Eddie, written and performed by Dominic Ingle? Do you think he's having a middle-aged breakdown, age 51? Or do you think he's doing it to get in Eddie's good books? Or do you think, basically, he's lost the plot? I think it's embarrassing. Um, for, for a grown man to write a love song to another grown man is pretty embarrassing, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, Dom Ingle, I think the weight of the Ingle legacy is weighed heavily on Dom. Sometimes yeah. you wonder if Dom even wants to be a trainer, but he's almost like he's been forced into training because he lives off that Ingle thing. But if you think about what we, what we consider to be the Ingle style, we probably haven't seen, we haven't even seen that since, since Ryan Rhodes, I don't think. Everyone else after that has kind of been just a different sort of style. Yeah, but Ryan Rhodes is a technician, isn't he? He, uh, you know, he, he had every shot in book, didn't he, Ryan? He just fought it wrong way, didn't he? Well, and a, and a lot of the guys that were properly trained by Brendan had that. You know, even R Richard had that. All these guys had that. So, Dom hasn't carried that on. Like, he's done his own thing, which is fair enough. But, it hasn't worked with guys he's taken from zero. Well, how many world champions has Dominic had from scratch? Uh, we're not going to say Kel Brook, are we? No, because he was Caldwell, wasn't he? We were back and forward. Well, I think he started with Caldwell, didn't he? I, I don't know, but I, I think that... Per, me, personally, I think he's done the song because... He wants to stay in the circle of trust. That's why I've done it. Why else would you do a song like that? Or he's done the song because he's hoping Eddie Hearn shares it and he gets all royalties off it. It could only be them two things, money or favours. I don't... Because otherwise, why... Because people may say, go on, yeah, it's a laugh and all that, but I know behind the scenes they're going like that. Do you know what I mean? That's embarrassing. It was embarrassing to see. It was embarrassing to hear. Uh, embarrassing. So it is embarrassing, but boxing, as they say, is a bit is a bit cringe. Now, like I say to people, never trade, never trade dignity for acceptance, ever. Yeah. Now moving on then to the drug issues. If Dominic Ingle has a fighter that fails a test. In his gym, again, it will be his fourth test failed in recent times. Should the board act and take his licence off him? No, because I don't think so. Jose Mourinho had four footballers fail at Tottenham over two, two or three years. Would Jose be fired by the FA? Uh, so what I will say is there are a lot of premiership footballers that are taking substances that would get them banned. I also know that the UK anti-doping have no interest in catching them. And so these, these teams, both in football and rugby, are warned, look, make sure everyone at the training ground on this week is clean. Anyone, anyone who might be injured, make sure they're not at the training ground. That's what you'll get. You'll, get, you'll just get small hints like that and the club know who they should be sending home. So... It's all, it's all dirty. What we need to do, Russ, is I don't want to target trainers. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have vendettas against people when it comes to drugs. I, I want it to be very simple. Every show, the board should mandate that you can test. Every show. Just test. Yeah. Yeah? Or if you're listed on a card, you should be tested at random. They should walk into gyms. Go into all of these gyms like Steel City. Go in there and just test guys at random. All right, then. Uh, what do you think about... Uh, two seconds. I forgot what I want to say then. Uh, Anthony Joshua. The rumours doing the rounds that if he bails out of boxing, Eddie Earn's going to bail out and go, do, go put concerts on with people like Beyonce, Jay-Z and Kanye West and whoever. 
he, that's what he wants to do because he's got he reckons it's a captive audience. Do you reckon Eddie Earn will bail? And do you think it'll be a similar situation like when Frank Warren kept chomping at the bit to get Steve Collins his shot against Chris Eubank Sr. back in the day and the champion, Barry Hearn's fat fighter, Eubank, Barry Hearn never won the purse bid and they had to fight in Ireland now. Do you think that's crazy? They had a big deal with Sky at the time, £10 million deal, which were a lot of money then in mid-90s. And yet again, Barry Hearn never won a purse bid. They went to Ireland and, and he got beat on points, didn't he, Eubank? Do you think that could be the scenario with Joshua, whereas Eddie doesn't want to put Joshua in with, with Fury because Fury beats him and then Eddie's out at game after rematch. And do you think that'll be the same? If that does happen, do you think Earn will go? Or, uh, or do you think that Eddie Earn just wants to talk about fighting Fury, but he's going to put as many obstacles in front as possible because he's filling his nappy and so is Joshua? So I don't think Joshua is. Um, I was talking to friends that were with Joshua over the last week or so. Joshua loves the fight. He loves the Fury fight. He's looking forward to the build-up. He's looking forward to the fight because he's like, I want to know how good I am. This isn't even about Fury. How good am I? Can I fight someone that people are calling one of the greatest? Joshua's not an idiot, mate. Hold on. Ah, oh. oh, forget that. Right, so Joshua's not an idiot. And he, he understands the fans think Fury's the best out there. And he wants to test himself. So Joshua fighting Fury is not a Joshua problem. Okay? So then we look at it and we go, what happens to Hearn if he loses Sky? That, if we forget losing Joshua. If Hearn loses Sky and you're stuck with the zone, who are now tightening their purse strings and don't want to spend the money they've been spending. So what is it you, you've got left to do? Is he going to promote concerts? Well, listen, they're Eddie Hearns in the concert world. Like, there's 20 Eddie Hearns out there. Do you see what I mean? There are yeah. people there who, who are more Eddie Hearn than Eddie Hearn could ever be. So him promoting concerts, I don't see that. I can see him trying to become like a, a TV star. I can see that happening. Trying to become almost like the modern day Jeremy Clarkson. I can see him trying to do that. Oh, but you joking. Yeah. Oh. No, you, you, I can see him doing something like Top Gear. And then he'll, he'll convince you that he's been in love with cars ever since he was eight years old. And that he always wanted to promote like the British car show or whatever it is. Oh, yeah, he, you know what he is. Yeah. So I can see him going off and trying something like that. Woodwood Festival or something like that. Oh. Yeah. But in terms of him being done with Matchroom, nah, he'll try something. He might try Rugby Union. He might try Rugby League. He'll, he'll definitely try something else because he's got that sort of ego where he thinks he can put that Hearn sauce on anything. But he turned rugby league off when they were just like, this isn't our sort of guy. I don't care how much money he brings to the sport, he'll ruin the sport. Yeah. Uh, exciting times ahead. Moving on then, right. The sky bias. Is it now out of control? And do the people who are spewing this sky bias, do they know what they're doing is wrong, but they've got to do it anyway to stay eating at the same dinner table? Do you know what, mate? I just think it's a habit now. Like, once they, once they, once they indoctrinate you for long enough, it just becomes a habit. You know, I always find it interesting that you get completely different commentary on Sky than you do on BT. <laughs> and sometimes when you watch a BT show, it's almost too technical. Like, you know, um, Richie Wood almost gets too technical where I'm like, mate, you know, I want to know how many GCSE results that you know I mean? Sam Noakes has got. I want to know, did he, get, did he get an A star in woodworking or not? You know, sometimes I want to know that sort of stuff. And BT don't give it to you, but Adam Smith will. Adam Smith will tell you what the kid's mum's called, what, what supermarket she used to work at. He'll tell you all of that stuff. Yeah, they're more interested in selling a story, aren't they? Then the fighter gets in and he's utter shite. Uh, so, so, do you know what I find interesting, Russ? What? How many times have matchroom fighters been on that pay-per-view stage and got knocked out? Like, like the Hearns guys rarely lose on points. Like, when they get to that pay-per-view level, a lot of them just get knocked out. Like Bellew. Bellew. Dylan. Just, uh, not just Laura, Dylan, Joshua, yeah. uh, Brooke. Yeah, Brooke they get twice. Out. 
twice broke. Yeah. They, so it's almost like it's, call it the match from pay per view curse. Like you know you're going to get knocked out. Paul Smith fought Ward, didn't he? Agavin Reese, Broner, Lee Purdy, Devin Alexander, all abroad, earned cop the TV money. The fighters took good so, idings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a business, isn't it? And I suppose it's not good. Even Frosch got ice, although the referee was too kind to stop the fight in the first round, like he should have done. We're against Groves. Yeah, that fight should have been stopped. Well, he got up, didn't he? And Bell saved him, didn't he? In that one round, first round. Yeah, but the ref should have looked at that and gone, "Nah, he's in no fit state to to continue." Like, you know, we don't know the damage that's going to do to Frotch in about five or six years. Well, he's on we uh, putting a massive triple garage for his Ferraris and his Range Rovers at the moment. So I don't think he'll be bothered about losing a bit of his memory, will he? He's happy, isn't he? Ah, oh, mate. But, but his beef with Joshua, though, man, I'm enjoying that now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because well, the, the interview is, that Frotch did regarding Josh saying that Joshua hasn't shown him anything since he got beat by Fat Kid in South. Yeah, and I always remember like Joshua shared a video that someone else had done where they slammed the laptop down, and Joshua just what he wrote. Joshua wrote something like, "It was it chatty patty." I love that. <laughs> Do you think that's why they've took Frotch off the pay per view at last weekend because they slipped Bellew in when I mean, it should have been Frotch? And because Joshua was part of the, the, the build up for the Dylan to beat Povetkin and then build the Dylan Joshua thing up. Do you think that that's why they took Frotch off because Joshua was going to be there? So people forget this. Joshua's main contract is with Sky, right? And Sky then subcontract the promotional rights to Eddie Hearn. That's what people don't talk about. Yeah. That's why the zone don't have access to Joshua, but they've got access to Hearn because Sky have the contract with Joshua. So if you upset Joshua, he doesn't go to Eddie Hearn. He doesn't need to. He goes to Sky and says, I don't want Frotch doing any more of these pay-per-views. Don't pay this guy another penny. Done. Do you think that's what's happened then? Yeah. Uh, Joshua's petty. Of course he's. Most, most elite boxers are petty. So yeah, I expect that to happen. Because that's first pay per view that Carl's not been on for since he retired. Yeah, there you go. See, you gotta be careful what you say in this game. Yeah, but are you not allowed to say the truth? Do you have to read? The, do you have to read off the script? For example, Bellew's opinion of Joshua is he looked fantastic and he did what he had to do in Saudi and he beat he won on points. Frotcher's opinion, well, he's probably the same as ours, that Joshua didn't fight like he normally does, did he? He didn't... Well, I thought he fought scared me, did you? So I don't think he fought scared. I think he fought like he knew he had to win. If that makes sense. So they're, they're two different things. I don't think he fought scared, because I don't think he's scared of Ruiz. I just think he's, he thought, if I don't win this fight, there's no more money. Therefore, I'll do what it takes to win. I think he got to that. He got to that Vladimir point. That you see, you see what I mean? Like when when Vlad was getting dropped, and then Vlad just said, "You know what? I don't need to do this. I just need to keep winning at all costs." Yeah. Well, I mean, this is how I look at it. The bias is out of control. And who do you think out of all those Sky pundits? is doing the most sucking up with the bias. Who do you think is the biggest rimmer at Sky? Is it Johnny Nelson, Bellew, Barker, Oliver, or Bean? Or Mr. Bean? Mm, Adam Smith will be at Sky for as long as he wants. Like He's a Sky lifer if he wants to be. So he hasn't got an issue. His father works there, doesn't he? Or he used to. Used to. Who does? Didn't his dad used to work there at Sky. Adam Smith's dad. I have no idea, mate. You, you've gone into. I might have that wrong. I might have that wrong. I'm sure his dad worked there, or had something to do with it. I could be wrong on that. All you hardcores, bit of wrong work for you. Do some digging and find out if Bean, old man, worked there. <laughs> well, no. Look, for me, 
it's more guys like like Darren Barker and this guy Chris Lloyd. You know the people who don't make money doing anything else. Like like Johnny's comfortable. Johnny will always always be able to do something. Macklin's got money. Like don't worry about that. Macklin's comfortable. There are a lot of people in boxing who. Yeah, are Macklin. I missed him off at list as well. Macklin, he's one at buyers yeah. group, isn't he? Yeah, but it's it's the guys that the Spencer Olivers and the Darren Barkers who need that extra money. Like they they're not making it elsewhere, so they need to be on the on the sky train, and they're the ones who are probably worse for it. But luckily, they don't get many commentary gigs. Yeah, it's. Uh, I just think that it, it's out of control. It's not that when the opponent lands with a punch, they don't bring it up, do they? It, it's. Right, moving on then. We agreed the sky bias is out of control. I don't want to hammer these people because they give me an ulcer. I don't even want to mention them again, but I will. But moving on to the referees situation and judging now. Ian John Lewis, we know he could stop a, a train at 125 mile an hour, don't we? Going through Jubilee line. Ian John Lewis and Victor Laughlin, right? Are they corrupt or incompetent? Uh, I think they do what they need to do to keep getting the shows they get. They just play the game. That's how I describe it. They play the game and they make sure that they're within the tram lines so that they get called back. Do you think that these judges and referees that we've got now, because they're all, a lot of them are nearly ready for retiring because they get to a certain age and they put them out, don't they? Do you feel that... The, it, that a lot of people, well, sorry, a lot of people are saying that there's no new judges coming through. It's the same old people. And, and there's no board. You know, like Charlie Giles, Robert Smith, and that uh, John Reese, and all them lot. They're all 70-odd-year-old men. They're all on board. And it, there's been no new faces, has there, for 25 years on that board. But uh, do you feel that it needs an injection of new people to run the board and a whole lot of new referees and new judges to wipe the, sl wipe the sl slain clean, swipe the slate clean, or, in other words, drain the swamp. Does the, does the, swamp, does the swamp need fucking draining? Who are you going to put in there, though, Russ? Excuse my English, all you young fans. Who, who, yeah, fans. who are you going to put in? Who would I put in? I don't know. I just want to see some... Look, they can get women linesmen, can't they? in football and they can have women fighting in boxing so why don't we get some women being referees and women judges from Britain is there a woman judge in Britain they're doing amateur but do they in professional it just needs shake no. up it needs a good shake up doesn't it the board are obviously an old boys club and we're going around in circles look we're talking about ref fights Every time there's a bad show, some judges always got it the wrong way around by two rounds. Now, if you should have it the two rounds the other way, he's four rounds out. Well, how can you be four rounds out in a ten-round fight? What fight are you watching? Now, we seem to be giving mm. referees a pass, don't we? When the public okay, so, up by two rounds. So the problem is, right, that makes sense if you, if you, if you judge dynamically, right? So let's say we all had an app. Right, we all had an app and we could score rounds in real time, right? And I think what you what you'd find is seventy percent of people would agree, thirty percent of people would disagree. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that thirty percent is wrong, it just means that they're seeing it through a different lens, maybe. So the the times I don't agree are when it's just too extreme one way or the other. Like if if something feels like a 115, 113 to me one way or the other and a judge gives it as a draw, I'm not going to cry. If you give it as 115, 113 the other way, I'm not going to cry either. It's when you start getting these wide scores, like it, it generally feels like a 115, 113 fight. And then there's like a, a 117, 111 and you're like, what? Yeah, it's bad, bad, bad scoring though, mate, I think. I mean... Ian Victor Laughlin to be five rounds out in a fight that clearly, Katie Taylor clearly lost by two rounds. So that means he's, he's seven rounds out in a 10 round fight. Fighting two minutes but you, out. But you know what happens, Russ? What? These, these officials, right? They spend 
weeks and months watching the same build up we do. And you hear about Katie Taylor's amazing this, Katie Taylor's amazing that. So you go into the fight with that in the back of your head. And, you, and so your assumption is everything Katie's doing is by design, even though you don't give assumed credit for basically bullying Katie Taylor and making Katie Taylor look old and tired and shop worn like she is. Yeah. So, so no one gave Pursuit credit for doing that. And that's the problem. You know, these judges, they, they get brainwashed like a lot of fans do. Like a lot of people in boxing who actually believe Katie Taylor is the best female boxer in the world. And you're like... And Wolf. Well, Anne's retired, but I get your yeah, point. Anne's been greatest ever in Louise Riker, aren't they? Uh, Anne Wolf, probably not. Her record's not that great. Lucia Riker, yes. But Lucia Riker kind of fought a bunch of stiffs, essentially. Hey, Jake, you know, I, I've, I've Louise Riker. I'd, I'd put Clarissa Shields above all of them, to be honest with you. I think, I think Clarissa Shields beats any female boxer of any era. Savannah Marshall beat her. I hope so. She's beat but one. We, yeah, but who's got two gold medals in the Olympics? And who's yeah, got all the world yeah. titles for us? You can't, you can't argue with results. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I'd love Savannah to have all those belts. I think it's time someone gave her a chance. Yeah, she deserves it. She's worked for it. And, and why that hasn't happened is beyond me. So why did she leave Hennessy? All of a sudden, Hennessy's got a platform now that could make Savannah a star. And now she's, I mean, she's with her. I'd be ringing Mick Hennessy now going, Mick, sorry, I made a mistake. Yeah. All right, then, moving on. Uh, but we, do, we would like to see Savannah get more chances. Moving on. Uh, Josh Warrington, Billy Joe Saunders, Callum Smith, uh, Savannah Marshall, are they getting the chances that they deserve at matchroom? Um, Ross, I said this to you before. Yeah. They're going to punish Warrington. I always said this. I was like, they're going to punish Warrington. They're going to punish Billy Joe. I don't know. So Savannah was like a make weight in a deal to get Huey Fury over. And that was the hope that if you get Huey Fury, Fury yeah, he's another one. He needs chances. Yeah, the Sky, these, aren't, these aren't Sky projects. Like, Hearn's not invested in any of these guys. That's why they're being treated the way they are. I would never have made that move. Like, Billy Joe was better with Frank because he was Frank's main guy. He's just an afterthought for Eddie Hearn now. And once that DAZN money dries up, then what, what's, what's everyone doing over there? All right, then. Uh, Eggington and Ted Cheeseman, have they got mileage on the clock, age 24 and 26? And does Hearn care about them? No, Hearn doesn't care about either of those two. They're cannon fodder now. That's, they're just there to make those, those filler fights. You know, like when you have a pay-per-view and you're like, we need something to get the crowd revved up. Oh, we'll just put in Ted Cheeseman and someone else, maybe Kieran Conway, maybe Scott Fitzgerald. We just put them all in. You just did, that's what that, that group are there for. They just mid card oh, filler. Yeah, it's just mid card filler. Mm. Interesting time. And what do you see happening with the zone then, Terry? Oh wow. So the zone's problems are simple. They have a mountain of debt to pay back, and no one's subscribing to the zone because they have nothing you want to watch. So they're not getting the revenue. People are cancelling. Because you're allowed to cancel your own membership, people are cancelling because, obviously, what, what are you spending money on if you're not getting the fights? So the zone's problem isn't that they're not growing. It's that they're shrinking. And so that debt's not going away. And what they have to start doing now is cutting costs, making redundancies, looking for outside investors, maybe even selling up. There's an option of even just selling up. Um, I, I think that's pretty much it. You know, so Hearn talking about he had a billion over eight years. I think you can cut that like by two thirds now. You know, you'll start to see Golden Boy and Canelo be treated differently. A lot of stuff's going to happen because that debt mountain's got to be what eight eight hundred million, nine hundred million that they're trying to pay down. Good luck. Do you think that basically Eddie Hearn and his dad Bazza they dipped the toes and? They carried on the blag by getting the big officers in Manhattan, making out that they were serious about taking over America and blah de blah. They've had their cut so far, and it hasn't worked out. And do you think they're just going to sail off into the sunset now from America and so, say we had to go and it didn't work out? Um, well, no, I think they'll leave with their tail between their legs, humiliated, because 
we we know how they were talking in the beginning. Pay per view is dead. Yada 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 yada. And now we're hearing him say, "I think the zone should have a pay per view capability." So. The world's actually moving towards pay-per-view at a time when Hearn was trying to move away from pay-per-view. So I think it's a bit of an embarrassing climb down. But I don't think it's, it's not Matchroom's decision, this one. This is, this is what basically COVID has done to the world. There's just not the money to be taking these kind of gambles anymore. There just isn't that kind of money in the market. So mm-hmm. Hearn's going to struggle to try and put on these fights, like trying to get the zone to, to back Joshua V. Pule. It's not doing anything for their numbers. So the zone would just say, we'll pass on that, thanks. And so there you go. That's, that's what I expect to happen. And it's going to get interesting next year, right? When everything's up for grabs. BT's up for grabs. Sky's up for grabs. The zone's up for grabs. And let's see who ends up where. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, what do you think about Callum Smith? Where do you think he I is now? I just don't. I really don't think about Callum Smith ever. Do you think Eddie's uh, delivered for him? Yeah, because he's very uninteresting. He's an average talent. He's just tall. I don't know what you could do. Like a giraffe is tall and it can walk around. I imagine a giraffe would have a better career than Callum Smith. Do you think that Canelo beats him? Yep, absolutely. I think Canelo's a better fighter. He's a better talent. He's too intelligent to let someone just get away with being tall. Yeah. Where do you see John Ryder heading now? Just let Ryder have some interesting scraps. Like, there'll be some American guys. Like, if I was her and I'd sell him, I'd say, look, John Ryder v. Caleb Plant. John Ryder v. Caleb Truax. John Ryder v. Charlo at 168 or at a catch weight. You know, just put Ryder in really entertaining fights. Almost like a super middleweight version of Dillian White. Just put him in really entertaining fights where he gets paid a lot of money. Yeah. What about Eubank Jr.? We haven't really spoke about him. He's been under radar for six or seven months now, hasn't he? Favourite boxer right now. Where no do one you, does do you think he's going to come back and be a different style? I'm hearing things that he's switched it in and all sorts in camp with Roy Jones and he's picked up loads of little tricks and of the trade. What do you think? Who are you hearing that from? One of my mates. <laughs> what do you think? No, no, no. No, no. Chris is, Chris is cool. He's just with Roy. Because that was the only place you could train when there was a lockdown. You couldn't train in the UK. So that's one of the convenient reasons. I think it's just a good place to be. It's a different environment for Chris. Chris doesn't really need to box. He'd be a success at anything he did. I just think he's one of those all-rounders who's annoyingly good at everything. Yeah. But... I'd, I'd like to see him. I'd like to see him fight Canelo. Like, Canelo should give him the fight next. Yeah. Let him look. Eubank Jr.'s got the win over De Gale. That's credibility. Go right. Okay, mate. You fight Canelo on September 12th or whenever Canelo wants to do it. Be Abraham do as well. Yeah. Eubank Jr.'s earned the right to fight Canelo. Now, I don't think he beats Canelo, but I think he gives Canelo all kinds of trouble. Because of his I'd like to see fitness that. and his chin. Yeah. Do you feel that uh, it, it's a, a cop? Do you feel that the people comparing Eubank to Carl Frott, saying he's got a chin and his fitness and that'll get him through, he's an athlete rather than uh, a skilled Joe, Joe I, Tony, James DeGale type of fighter? So, so when I look at Eubank, he did a better job on Abraham, actually fought together instead of running away from him. And I thought he did better against Groves than Froch did. He was just unlucky enough to get the knockout. So I don't think you can compare Eubank Jr. to Carl Froch. I think Eubank Jr., had they been around in their primes at the same time, Jr. would have stopped Froch. Comfortably. Fuck off, Terry. You're out of your mind. The hate for Carl Froch from you is, you're out, you are out your mind saying Eubank stops Froch. You were his sparring partner. And you, you, listen, mate, you know what happened in the sparring. How many times? Yeah, well, look, Froch had to wear, yeah, Froch had to have that elbow thing there because Eubank was just hammering him everywhere. And I remember there was a time oh, when... Oh, Terry, you, you're out of your mind. I actually remember Carl went home and cried because he didn't know how to be Junior. And so McCracken had to go and have a chat with him. That's really how he won the fight against Groves. Junior was so hard to deal with sparring-wise. Like Carl said to himself, 
and it's in, it, I swear it's in his book. If I can, if I can handle Eubank Jr., I can easily stop growth. That's what gave him the confidence. <laughs> oh my! So Eubank tough and frot chuck for growth fight inspiring, did he? Ah uh, well, I, he showed him the way. That's for sure. Is this why you always stick this picture up here, Andre Ward, on the side of my screen here instead of your face? You you like to have a dig at me, don't you? We a son of S O G. What's that, son of God? <laughs> that is a that's a beautiful sparring set, though. I am jealous of that. Moving on. What are you drinking there, Paul? What are you drinking? Uh, black sheep, real ale. Oh, mate, you seem to be starting early then. Bank holiday spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bank, I just usually have one of them before they have one. Where's Dean Why? Where's baby Ting? Where is Dean? He's six foot seven. Dean's all right, man. Like, he, he messaged me. We we're, were messaging back and forth on Instagram. Dean's cool, man. Like, like he said, just back to the drawing board. We'll come back again stronger, better. What else could he say? Hey, what else could he say? Well, it's funny how I, once I call him out, he appears on a on a channel with a thousand subscribers, and uh, does an interview with Dave Colwell and him and this other dude on Zoom. Basically, the vultures are circling around the carcass. That's what's happening. They're all trying to justify their positions around Dylan now because I've heard that. Dylan were angry over a few things, then upset, and now he's going to play the blame game. So just watch it all. It's going to unravel like an like an onion. You know when you peel an onion, it unravels, doesn't it? Well, watch it unravel. Yeah, I I I still don't understand why you get rid of Mark Tibbs. Like when you had that momentum with Mark Tibbs, I didn't see why the change was needed. I genuinely didn't. It can only be over money, can't it? But we're not going to get to know until they both come out and say it. But and Mark won't say anything. You know what, Mark? What this, we've got too much class, Mark Tibbs, aren't they? They're, they're, they're just they've got a bit of class. They're not. They're going to keep it in house, aren't they? But Mark Tibbs' stock's gone up, though, hasn't it? Now eleven and zero with Dylan, five and zero. Dylan and him split up. Dylan gets knocked out. You never yeah. know. Mark Tibbs might end up training, training a world champion. In, in near future, people, world champions might want to come to him, Terry. You never know, do you? I, I look. If if it was me, and I and I was training with someone like a Ben Davis, and I saw Mark Tibbs with a free gym, I'd just be looking there, going, "Mark Tibbs is like an upgrade on a Ben Davis." And that's no shots to Ben, but Mark's got that that same kind of thing about him, hasn't he? That you know, just just drill the fundamentals and all that sort of stuff. Sometimes you just gotta go back to basics. Yeah, and you know, the, a lot of guys forget that. Oh, the Bacoli, Bacoli might look at the situation, or I don't know, the, the Kel Brook, or anybody could look at the situation. It was a great fighter or a good fighter, and think, you know what, I'm going to go with Mark Tibbs. He's 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 not got Dylan no more, and there's an opportunity for me there to be trained by somebody who they were saying. But this, everybody said Dylan White were most improved. Now. Now that Mark Tibbs is not training him, there's slots available for people to be trained by Mark Tibbs, isn't there? So the, the, the money, the, the circle goes round, the magic roundabout goes round, doesn't it? What about Liam Cameron? I don't know what Liam's doing. I don't know. Well, Mark so, so, so you, you see the ruling, haven't you? That if you've been banned for recreational drugs, you might be free to compete again from January 2021. Who says that? You can so they're, they're, they're now moving away from the recreational drug bans to the PED drug bans. So I think if Liam can like, put an appeal in or say, look, if you change the rules, can I be considered for this? If I'm Liam, that's exactly what I'm doing. Now. Well, I hope so, because at the end of the day, I mean, Liam won't, won't admit it. Sorry, he hasn't. Liam's not having it with his charge, this cocaine charge, right? So he says, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not guilty, Russ. He's told that to Dennis. So Dennis says, look, Liam, did you have it? You can tell me. He's gone, no, I didn't, Dennis. So Liam's still innocent, so we have to go on what Liam says. Now, he were offered an 18-month ban, right, when he went for his hearing. So that meant he would have, he'd been waiting six months. So that meant he would have had to do another year, but he wanted to fight straight away. So it ended up a four-year ban. So I feel for him, but Tyson Fury got a two-year ban for three charges. 
one of them recreational, one of them performance enhancing, and one of them refusing. So why should Liam get four years for recreation? It's wrong, isn't it? But he doesn't have lawyers, Porky. But the last I heard, yeah, Liam was 16 and a half stone and he were going into camp to do that BKB. That's yeah, no, he's about, he's, he's about 12 now. Liam's down to about 12. 12? Oh, that's good there, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so, so, so he's going to be... He's, he might be sparring Frotch, actually, to, to get ready for the BKB. Well, like, it. Try and keep it serious, because you're letting your son down when you keep going off track. <laughs> I don't know what weight Liam is. If Liam is 12 stone, I'm buzzing for him, but I don't think he is because he's six foot one, Liam, isn't he? Now, what is he? You know, he's down though because. Well, yeah, he did lose weight. I heard he was doing some training. He was training hard, actually, because Michelle told me she was Liam's training hard. So that's good. I was pleased for him. I was pleased for, I was pleased for him. But he's. he's uh, his missus, his daughter's died in a car crash at age 20, so, and Liam's her stepdad, so he, he's having a bit of a tough time at the moment, so I really feel for Liam and his family. Uh, and that's what I told him. So I told him, talk to you, Cat, see if they're really doing this thing for January 2020. And then you've got four months to get in shape. Yeah. Well, I hope he comes back because he's a great fighter, Liam. I'd like to see Sam Sheedy come back as well. I like Sheedy. I like no, him. mate, mate, you saw that last fight. No, no. Well, no. Sam's really a light middleweight, isn't he? You shouldn't be in with a big super middle and they're both meeting at middle because Sam's down here, 154 pounds. Liam's really a 168, so they both meet in middle at 160, 11 stone six. But yet, when they get in the ring, they're like that. You see what yeah, I mean? I, 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 I wouldn't want to put Sheedy in. in. Nah, no, no, no. Let's not put that Sheedy in. That weight division don't we for a reason, right? Because fighters are not superheroes. Now, you're not going to get a nine-stone man beating an 18-stone man. This is why we have to get it right. And if you and if you remember, do you remember about four years ago when Coogan used to do them sit-downs with Eddie Earn? And they used to, Coogan used to read all his questions out, what we'd sent in. And I sent one in. And this is four years ago. And I said, Ed, ask Eddie why we don't have a weight division between light heavyweight and cruise away. And Eddie just dismissed the question. I don't know if it was because it were me or, or because he just didn't want to talk about it. Well, now they're all looking to do it, aren't they? Well, I was the pioneer for that. And the video is on my channel, if you if you go and look. I did a video <laughs> a few years ago. But everybody said I was cuckoo, didn't they? Oh, Porky, you cuckoo. Well, they're not saying it now, are they? Because they kept going on about safety's paramount and that. Well, this is how I look at it, and I'm not a Tony Bellew fan, but Tony Bellew was a six foot three man, and it killed him to make light anyway. But he thought he could still retain his power on the night if he put 15 to 20 pounds on. So he was giving it ring at like 190, 192, 94. So when he come up against the Tony Adonis Stevenson, he got rendered unconscious, didn't he? Basically, he was seeing stars. Now. Tony, after that, moved up to cruiserweight, which was a safer bet. But he were caught in that situation where he weren't big enough to fight your Tyson Furies and Joshua's. And I don't think he had the skill set to survive at £200 with those guys. So he thought he could be cheeky and go to 175. But a lot of fighters are caught in the middle between the 175. Wait, 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 wait. hold on, hold on, hold on, Matt. hold on. Tony Bell used the guy who fought AB, four ABA finals. Yeah, he he heavyweight. So, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. He did. No, he did. He did one at ninety-one plus, and he did one at ninety-one. Yeah, but Tony, that was back in the day, Teddy, when the, they weren't giants. I mean, Tyson Fury is six foot nine. Wilder's six seven. Joshua's six six and a half. These are big guys, yeah. aren't they? Michael Hunter fought Fury when he was. Yeah, it, it, remember, you, skills can negate anything. If you're skillful enough, you're good enough. So I think. I think Bellew's probably not the example to use. Cleverly is the example you want to use in terms of someone who, who was probably too big for light heavy, but too small. Started out as a welterweight, cleverly. Yeah, but what's he? Six two. Six two, yeah. Yeah, six two, and he, his training weight, from what I remember, was one hundred eighty four pounds. Like if if he trained his nuts off and ate what he wanted, he'd be one hundred eighty four pounds. Yeah, and you think. That that would be a good weight class to have. So something, one seventy five, maybe one eighty five, one ninety, 
and then a 205. Go back to the old cruiserweight at 190, do you mean? Uh, maybe have cruiser, then junior heavyweight, then heavyweight, something like that. Yeah. I, think, I think you need a gap. So you need a gap for, for your lads like this Babbage guy to fit in as a heavyweight without having to fight you know, David Price or whatnot because that's not entertaining. And yeah. just let the freaks fight amongst themselves. Yeah. Well, I'd like to see a light cruiser at 190, a cruiser at 200, which we've got now, and then a super cruiser at 210. And anything above 210, you're a heavyweight. For the simple reason that it'll flush out all them guys that are trying to bend rules. So all we're going to add to it is a 190 and a 210. We're still going to keep it at 200 pound, but you go from light every 175, Light cruiser 190, cruiser 200, super cruiser 210. So then it goes 190, 200, 210. Just add two divisions. So it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. And so you've got the problem of, I'll call it the, the Chisora problem. Derek's too big for cruiserweight, but he's too short to be a heavyweight. Right? Mm -hmm. So you want something between cruiser and where these kind of freaks are. Now, the freaks generally start around 235. David Price is 250, 260. Fury, 250, 260. Joshua's 240 to 250. Um, Hergovic is about 250. Yoka's 250. Dubois, 245 to 250. What's Miller? That's... What's Miller? <laughs> <laughs> think, think of a number between 200 and 300 and multiply it by five. <laughs> no, so basically, Russ, if it was me, I want we've got to work downwards, right? So we need to solve the heavyweight problem. The fact that you can have a guy come in at 209 like Wilder did and box a guy who's like, I don't know, 260 like Brazil was, right? So let's cut that off. Or what I would prefer to do is I prefer to have a cutoff point like the UFC do and say, you can't box heavyweight unless you're under 260. That's what I'd do. And then you work down. So I'll go 260. And I'd go down to 220, and then 200, 190, 175. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they work it. But I think they'll do it because they'll be thinking it's more sanctioning fees, more belts, more happier fighters, better for promotion. More knockouts. More knockouts. And you'll get guys coming down from heavyweight to super cruiser, and you'll get guys who are struggling at light heavyweight, going up to light cruiser, won't you? Do you see where I'm coming from? Well, and also you finally get a chance for big guys to get their recognition for moving up and down the weights, like the little guys do. Yeah, so you might have guys at uh, light heavyweight who want to win, who've won a world title, but are really cruiserweights, light cruiser, super cruiser. They could be four weight champions. Cleverly could even come back, couldn't he? <laughs> Has anyone found him? I mean, he's in a dark place at the moment, Nathan, uh, as regards the Peruvian. So. <laughs> the Calzaghi curse. The Calzaghi curse, yeah. I actually don't mind Nathan cleverly, actually. I don't mind him. He's. Uh, I just think that he had a lot of gifts, didn't he? He, had a, he was gifted a WBO, one, because his uh, Bremer couldn't get on an aeroplane because of his bail conditions. I mean, Frank Warren pulled the blinder there, didn't he? <laughs> He must have known he couldn't leave country, so we upgraded him to world champion. But what do you think about Enzo Macunelli coming coming back? Don't want to see it. Really it don't want to see it. Yeah, it's a massive mistake. Massive. Look, everyone looks good hitting the bags, and everyone looks good sparring in 16-ounce gloves. As soon as you start getting hit in 10-ounce gloves, it all starts to unravel pretty quickly. I don't want to see it. Yeah. yeah. It's a shame, isn't it? Moving on then, uh, what next for the white rhino, David Allen, from Cunningsborough, Doncaster, DN12? What next for David Allen? What do you think, Terry? Where does he go now? Bacoli. Bacoli. Yeah. Yeah. Because Hearn doesn't like having guys around the same level where he's like, you two just fight each other and then you work out who I should invest in. So I think Dave Allen will get the Bacoli fight. Do you feel that Dave saying that he'll fight Babic 
what a good idea, but now saying he won't fight Tom Little, because that's revved Tom Little up, on it? Um, well, Babbage has the profile right now. That, that's the hot ticket where you're, you can attach a name to him and it, you know, it does you the world of good. Tom Little doesn't have that. Tom Little is a favourite within boxing circles, if you see what I mean. He hasn't crossed over yet. So I can see why Dave would choose that. But realistically, if Usyk Vichasora happens in October, I see Dave versus Pocoli on the undercard of that. Or Dave versus a Kuzmin or something like that. That's what I see being like a, a co-main event. Do you see... Eddie Hearn mentioned the other day, right? I know this because I've been told. Eddie Hearn mentioned Cash Alley's name the other day, right? For a fight for Babic. Do you think Dennis would take that and Richard Towers? Oh, wow. Steve Richard? Got... Yeah, I think Richard would take that because that's the kind of thing Richard loves. Like, he loves that, you know, how do you, how do you tame the beast? How do you control all that wild fury? And can Cash Alley use his weight advantage to just kind of bully him about? And I think Cash has that in him. I know Cash is eager to, to build that kind of profile and also to redeem himself because, you know, you know what people remember him for. Biting David Price. Yeah. I like Cash Alley. His house is about 300 yards from my office in Rotherham, and I like him. And the guy, uh, guy next door with Rolls Royce, he's big mates with him. And he's very popular in Rotherham, Cash. And I just think that we need to forgive Cash for the bite. And people need to move on. People keep going on about this bite. And Tony Bellew were going on about it. But he never said a word when Derek Chisora bit that guy in the ring, did he? But Derek's his pal, isn't he? So I think people need to give Cash another chance. He's a nice kid, Cash. And uh, they need to, need to let him move on with his career. He's won a central area belt. Uh, but he doesn't do. He don't. He's not on social media. He don't play the social media game. Dave Allen's on social media all his life, and they play the game, don't they? They know they have to play that game to get in the Eddie Earn. Cash don't play it, but I think Dave Allen against Cash Alley is a fifty-fifty fight, and I think it's a good fight. But you know, I'm hearing stories that Dave would want X amount to fight him, and I can Dave call for that kind of money. I'm not going to say what it were. <laughs> When Cash has already won a central area belt, and he would be, and well, he was doing better against David Price than Dave Allen, well, wasn't he? That's true. Dave uh, Allen lost the second of every round for ten rounds. Like I said, you you're falling into the trap of trying to think of this as a sport, it's a business. Yeah, I know. Dave yeah, Dave's cool. popular on social media and blah de blah, but he's not won a belt. Well, I can I find know. popular people on YouTube like. Well, you know, well, Eddie Logan, Eddie Paul, Logan Paul's popular on YouTube. We've had him turn pro, haven't we, for one fight with Eddie? There you go. That's what, and this is my point. <laughs> it's a business, right? People, ha people have to hit numbers every year. And if your fight does numbers, it will happen. If it doesn't, it won't happen. I have to hit numbers myself, Teddy, but my numbers are like that. <laughs> Although yeah, lately, yeah. we seem to be doing better. Well, mate, because you don't play the social media games. Well, on Twitter, I can't get on from this IP address or one in office. Every time we try, I, I, it don't work. <laughs> so I'll give up. Mate, why don't you just buy a new phone? You just do it from there. No, because as soon as I start, I'd have to call me some Porky's Corner and you get all these grasses telling tales and they just they just shut you down, don't they? So I've give up, I've given up on, on that. I'm happy with YouTube, but channels going in the right direction. But moving on then, what do you think about Al Heyman at the moment? Do you think all the chat in Ring Magazine and Boxing News that he's putting the best shows on at the moment? Not the Razzmatazz, Eddie's fight camp. It was pretty dressed up, pretty good, wasn't it? But Al Heyman's shows, that's the cream in it at the moment. Do you think? Do you agree with Ring Magazine? Yeah, I think, I think Al's been doing the best shows for the last four years. Remember, go back to 2017, Russell. The reason why we loved 2017 was because Heyman said, I'm putting all my guys in with each other. That's why we had the 2017 that we did. You know, Frampton, Santa Cruz. Um, I'm sure that was like Garcia Thurman. All those sorts of fights were just happening. And we almost got, and they weren't even happening on pay-per-view, really. We were just watching them and going, 
okay, is this what Al Heyman's going to do? And so Al's been doing that year after year. It's just that he's low key, so people think, oh, he's fallen off. But if you look at Heyman's stable now, he can still make massive fights. And he is. So he's giving us the Charla versus Sergey Devlinchenko. And then you look at that card and you go, oh, that, that, that's a pay per view card. Like, that's a legitimate pay per view card. So I think Heyman is, he's number one at the moment. I think Aram's getting there, but Aram's still got some stars he needs to build. And then the rest of it's all much of a muchness. Do you think that Al Heyman has done really well to say that he hasn't got one social media account and that everybody seems to pay homage to him? He keeps it in-house, doesn't he? He doesn't do interviews and all that. Do you think he, that's part of his allure? No, I just think he, he has a good stable and he puts on competitive fights. I think he, he basically just does the most basic thing a boxing promoter can do is put on competitive fights and make sure his fighters get paid well. Yeah. That, that's why people respect him. So he's not popular like Hearn is because of a quote and a soundbite. He's popular because people respect what he's doing. Mm. Yeah, I see what you mean, mate. I see what you mean. But uh, they all seem to give him, give him the, big, the big up, don't they? Leonard Ellaby, Mayweather, Charles, Tank Day. But they've all made money. Like, they've all... <laughs> the thing is, um, and I know this from someone who's spoken to Al. Al will sit you down. Well, it might be on a phone call, but you'll sit down with Al, and Al will say, my role in your career is to make sure you get paid today and that you have an income after you retire. That's everything I do. So, like, the way Heyman structures his purses, the way he does all of this stuff, is that, you know, you don't get all your money in one go because you just waste it. And that's why people stay with Al, because Al's broken it down to them and said, look, you're a long time retired, so you want to make sure that you've got these things that are going to drive your income going forward. Low risk, high reward. And that's what he does. Yeah, I just, I just feel that, I want, I, well, I think we should get, somebody should get an interview with Al Heyman. I want to hear his voice. I mean, does he even exist? Nope. Obviously, I know he exists. Nope, nope. nope. I, don't, I, don't, I don't want any of that. I think what he's doing is spot on. Why, why should he? Do any interviews? Well, why should he? He's a number one promoter in boxing, but you can't get an interview with him. He's like that guy in Charlie's Angels, isn't he? Who sits behind the chair. You get to see Bert, Perfect. not Charlie. Yeah. Well, do you know what? The more you talk, the more people complain. So you're better off saying nothing. What about Eddie Hearn? We can't get him off internet. He's got a podcast. He's an ex-golf agent, ex-cricketer, ex-boxer. He's a broadcaster. He's got a book out. He's a boxing promoter, boxing manager. He's done everything. He's the chairman of darts. Is he snooker, football, whatever? He's a jack of all trades, Eddie Earn, isn't he? Master of none, as we're Master finding out. None. Do you think Eddie will ever get credit, or do you think they'll just say his dad handed it over to him? No, you can't ever say that. Like my test for anyone is, even if you inherit something. Can you make it 10 times bigger than the thing you had? And it has done. It's an hard worker. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you can't disrespect her for that. Like, I, I mean, give you a yogurt of teeth. No, nah, I just I say to anyone, like Porky, if you took over, let's say you took over someone's car lot today, right? Yeah. And then two years from now, you've got five car lots. I'm like, mate, that's all you. Okay, someone handed you over one car lot, but you still had to turn one into five. I won't be able to do that, mate, because our man's on it. One, one is too much to me. I, I, you know, one's too much. You've got to learn, got to, learn to delegate, my friend. Hey, delegate, yeah. yeah. Well, that yeah. means you've got to have people around you you can trust, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Exactly. But uh, I just feel that boxing at the moment, in the UK, not Al Heyman and all them over there, I mean, for a boxing in the UK is struggling, but getting back to Bob Arum, before I forget what I was saying, do you see Bob Arum and Frank Warren going at it in court over Tyson Fury? Because I'm hearing little tiny whispers that they might, it might not be as cosy as what people are thinking. Tyson in the middle, Bob to the left, Frank to the right. Who, who is the, who's going to be the dominant person? Because Bob's not going to be here forever, is he? What does the contract say? 
I don't know. I don't know what the contract says. I, but... and I, don't, I don't think anyone knows what the contract says. So everything's, that's just rumour and gossip. There'll be a contract that regulates all the relationships in Tyson Fury's life. Yeah. Let's see that first. Then let's know, let's know because I wouldn't be surprised if Hennessy is still getting a slice of something. Mm. Well, good luck. I hope Mick is. Because he's going to need it, Mick, because he needs a gastric band, Mick. I'm worried about his health. Did you see that picture? Did you see Mick on that show last week? He's put yeah. weight on him in the like, pandemic. Man, he needs to get on the Porky program. He needs to get two shakes a day and uh, chili and a jacket tate and you don't eat the skin at night or soup with six crackers and soggy for dipping them into your soup. That's what <laughs> Mick needs to do. But I like Mick Hennessy. You know that, don't you? I mean, some people in boxing I don't like. Some I like. I just like, I just like, I like Mick Hennessy. I like him a lot. I think he's all right. I think he's, he comes over genuine. Obviously, I don't know him as well as other people, but he's always been right with me. If I was a young boxer, I'd, I'd, I'd have signed with Hennessy. I'd have said, Mick, well, this, is what we have to, this is what we have to look at, right? When we're, we're very critical, aren't we? We're like critics, aren't we? Look, Mick Hennessy, Carl Froch turned pro with him. Tyson Fury did, and nobody wanted Tyson, let me tell you. Nobody wanted to stump up what they wanted. John Fury were hawking Tyson all over the place. Ian's messed him about, Warren did. Mick Hennessy stumped up. He went, they went British, they went, sorry, English, British, Commonwealth, Irish, European, world title, Ring Magazine, Lanille, with Mick Hennessy, 25 and 0. I don't know how many knockouts with 18. And then it all fell apart, didn't it? Right? Did it all fall apart over the Nandrolone? Or was it about. The rematch, should he have signed the rematch, even though it was a mandatory fight? I don't know and I don't care, but we have to give Mick credit. We have to give him credit for Carl Froch. He took him to the to two WBC titles, didn't he? He went through the gears, he was blowing everybody away. So he did well with them, didn't he? He signed Newey Fury from debut. He nearly pulled it off against Parker, they got robbed. Who else has he had from debut? Chris Eubank signed with him, didn't he, from debut? Well, I, I think I think, I think Mick did well with the Furies. Yeah. Hey. Mick, Mick did well. Mick, Mick did well with the Furies, and he did well with Eubank Junior. And Froch. That's that, that's what others to say, not for me, man. But why did he not do well with Froch? Oh yeah, because he didn't get him commercial activity like Eddie Hearn did. Well, Mick's boxing, isn't it? I'm boxing, right? Let, let's talk boxing. Carl Froch signed with Mick Hennessy. He were he were messing about down there at that Lennox Lewis College for about a year, Carl. After after winning uh, bronze at World Championships in, in 2001 with Davy Day, it, it was about eight or nine months up and down we, at that college. You know, we were cracking. You know what I'm on about. It's near you, isn't it? Clapton, is it? Clapton? That yeah, it's miles from me, but it's close enough. Yeah, yeah, whatever, around there. Now, he turned pro with Mick, and they did well, didn't they? Right? He won a world title, British title, won it outright, the British title. Won a world title, John Pascal. They went in Super Six. I think Mick Hennessy did his did the best he could, right? Just because he's not one of them guys that after 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 parties and stuff like that, he discovers talent, Mick Hennessy, and everybody says he's the best in the business. Wait, 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 wait. You're stop, going stop, about. Wait, hang on a minute. No, no. You're going about the box cup, don't you, Aringe? Mick's no, wait, wait, hold year, on. You know, and ABAs. No, no, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. What do you mean he discovered talent? Like, what do you mean? Does he, 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 he didn't discover Froch. We all knew Froch. Froch was on the BBC like when they did the World Championship. Amateurs. When you sign people from amateurs, Terry, and they go pro with you, they say you discover them, don't they? You know what I mean, don't yeah, but, yeah, but he, didn't, he definitely didn't discover Froch because Froch was on the BBC when they did the Worlds. He didn't discover Fury. Fury was equally televised. Um, John O'Donnell. Well, he signed them, didn't he, and put the money up, didn't he, to go pro? That I agree with. So if you say to me right. he assembled a good stable, a hundred percent, but he didn't like discover those. Two thousand and two, he assembled that, didn't he? Who? Huh? The class of two thousand and two, Mick Hennessy assembled that, didn't he? When he had BBC contract. Who who was in that? Froch, Darren Barker. He came later on, didn't he, Darren Barker? 
Lee Mead. Yeah, but, yeah Darren was in 2002. No, the real class of 2002 was when Mick got his first BBC deal because that's when Carl turned pro. Matthew Furwell, Lee Meager, Carl Frotch, Darren Barker came a bit later, didn't he? Probably a couple of years later. Uh, Lenny Dawes, what are you in that as well? Lenny Dawes, yeah, he was. I've got it on a picture somewhere in my office. Fury came in 2008. He, he ended up doing a camp in Ireland with Carl Frotch when Frotch fought. He should have fought Denny Sinkin, but he pulled out and he fought Albert Rabaki. Tyson sparred out there, that Mike Perez, before he turned pro. And I'll tell you, this is a true story. Tyson set about him and he jumped out the ring, that Mike Perez. And Tyson had not even turned pro. And it, and it was just before Tyson turned 20. Tyson were 19 at the time. That's a true story. And that Mike Perez were a big puncher. And that's when Carl Frotch said to me, Tyson Fury's got a good fighting art. He'll go all the way. They all saw that sparring in Ireland. That's 2008 before. And Tyson's debut weren't until December because I was sat ringside when he fought on his debut when Frotch won world title. That's a true story, that. So you've got to give Mick Hennessy credit for signing these people and going pro with him. Yeah, along the lines, they won world titles and they left Mick. As regards signing people and going over the line, I give him credit, me, don't you, Terry? Uh, you uh, so sh show my youth here, man. Right, when I was coming up, all those guys were blue chippers. Darren Barker, blue chipper, his brother Gary was equally blue chip, God rest his soul. They were blue chip because I, I think Darren had done the Commonwealth. They reckon he were good, him, don't they, Gary? Yeah, so. So you're looking at guys and you go, okay, these are all Commonwealth Games level guys. Frosh fought in the world. Fury should have gone to the Olympics in 08. But there was obviously like, Terry Edwards had all kinds of problems with the travellers he had in his current squad. He was like, I'm not adding another one. So I think that was why they took David Price instead of Fury. So you have all of that. What I liked about Hennessy, and I always give Hennessy credit for this, is he never got you the best purses, but he taught you about the game. From all the people I know that have worked with Mick, they just said, nah, he'll always teach you how boxing works. So he'll never take the piss. Like, you know, some promoters like to keep you stupid so they can keep taking money from you. At least Hennessy went, no, nah, no, nah, this is how the game works. This is what I'm going to pay you. This is where you can get your money from. You can go over there and get some sponsorships. I don't take any money off that. This, that, and the third. And he walks you through that. I don't know if, he's, if he still does, but he used to. And a lot of promoters don't do that. They'll just have you just stupid and naive, and they just keep taking money from you. You go, oh, okay, then. Yeah. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. I thought he did well for Lenny Dawes. I mean, he did well for James DeGale as well. I know he turned pro with Frank, but then he came to Mick, didn't he? James DeGale. I thought he, Mick did well for him. But he, he that was like, probably the time. I think DeGale should have gone to Hearn at that time. I think that would have been good for him. Because mm. that, that was when Eddie was starting to to, you know, to raise his head above the parapet. Yeah. Yeah, we have to get the earned credit. He's, be, he's very driven, very hard working. But do, do you feel at the moment that the lies are, 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 are becoming more frequent every single day in contradictions, do you think? Yeah. So, okay. Hearn's made a decision, right, where he's gone, I can't trust my fighters to to push this thing forward. Only I can do it. So he just has to be in front and answer questions. And so we, we've talked about this privately. Eventually you talk yourself into a circle because you've said so many things so many times that you end up right back where you started. Where he's had to admit, actually Wilder earns more money than I said. And this, that, this, that, and the third. The problem Hearn has is he says stuff and doesn't get a punch in the face for it. Because if we said the stuff that Hearn says, <laughs> Yeah, no, but honestly, if Hearn had to take a punch in the face from Wilder, do you think he'd say the same things? No. That's my point. No, he won't. He won't. That's the one thing, like, when I started off doing these podcasts and stuff, I remember Steve Bunn saying this, and he just said, do not say anything on a microphone you wouldn't say to the person's face, and you'll be all right. Yeah. And he was right. 
Yeah, all right then. Uh, women's boxing, Terry. What did you think about Terry Harper against Natasha Jonas? Who won? And where do they go now? And where does the loser go? I thought Jonas won. Um, I don't think Jonas really needs the belts. I think Natasha Jonas will always be a bigger national treasure than Terry Harper. I think, you know, she put the best on for the country, if you see what I mean. So that's Natasha Jonas. I'd like to see if, if Jonas is really as good as we suspect she is. Put her in with, with Katie Taylor at 135. Let those two go at it. They're, they're about the same generation. So let them go at it, make a few quid, ride off into the sunset. I wouldn't mind watching that. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that Terry Harper will fight her in a rematch or do you think she'll swerve it? Nah. I think I think they'll swerve any competitive matches for a little while because really we want to see Harper versus Michaela Mayer. That's the reality of this. They are of a similar generation. Let these two go at it. Let's stop pretending. Leave Jonas and Katie Taylor to make their money. You two fight each other. That's all we're asking for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's about it. Terry, we've had a we've had a good natter. Uh, we, we, I just want to end on this question. Uh, do you think that this time in six months, sorry, this time next year, September next year, do you think we might have an undisputed heavyweight champion of no. the world from England? No. 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 no and no, if not, no. why not? Who's, uh, who's, to, who's at fault? Uh, I think they're all in on this. I'm now of that view, they're all in on this. What, Frank and Eddie, Tyson, Joshua? Frank, Eddie, Joshua, Eddie, Bob. All of this stuff, right? Because let's just pause for a second. Think of all the stuff Joshua and Fury have said about each other. Right? If you meet me in my bear after saying all of that stuff, Porky, I'm jumping out the car mm. immediately. I'm pulling up, I'm jumping, I'm saying, this is, forget pay-per-view. You've got something to say to me, I'm here. Say it now. So to turn that into a friendly photo opportunity tells me everyone's in on this. Yeah, that's what Dennis reckons. Because the great thing about conspiracy is this, Russ, right? Not everyone has to be in on it. So if you look at Hey Bell, you, I always suspected that Eddie and David knew that this was all a setup, it was all a fix, and no one told Bell you. It Bell came you out, didn't it? Track. It came out that it was all a fix, wasn't it? Hey, hey Bell, you, Bell, you, hey, we're... It came out, didn't it, about a year later, didn't it, that they played everybody, didn't it? Yeah. Well, no, so I don't think everyone did. I don't think Bell, you knew this was a setup. I think David knew, and I think Eddie knew. Yeah. And so they planned it out, and then they didn't tell Bell, you because Bell, you had to act naturally, right? Bell, you had to be Bell, you. So you, you deliberately wind him up, you get into a pushing and shoving contest with him, and then once Bell, you erupts and you get that traction, then you say to Tony, listen, Tony. He did that all for the pay-per-view, okay? Just play along with it. Then you bring him in on the conspiracy. I think this is what's happened with Fury Joshua. That I think Team Fury have known all along that this was going to be the game plan. They probably already know when the fight's going to happen. Mm. And so everything we, they do now is just to, to build up anticipation and interest. Do you and think so it'll be you, another Mayweather Pacquiao where they build it up and it'll be overcooked? I think it's overcooked already. Like, it was cool when they were both undefeated. But now you're like, yeah, whatever. Now you've got a loss on a record and other ones have been in a draw where they got flattened twice. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, lo it's losing a bit of sparkle. Do you feel that it'll end up going the, the way of, I mean, I've only heard this last night after speaking to somebody who were a former manager of one of these fighters, but do you feel that Khan and Brooke, who now are gagging, for it, and but no, nobody's interested. Do you think Joshua and Fury might go that go on that long and be overcooked that eventually, even the big money people and the top brass are going to say we don't want to hear? Really. I don't think the dislike is that real. I think the the Khan Brook dislike is real. Wait, what is it, is it anymore? Because nobody wants it, does it now? Yeah, but if you if you look at Khan and Brook. I remember they did the ABAs together. Khan won at 60, Brook won at 64. He might have beaten Smedley's kid, actually. Uh, yeah, Khan, yeah, Khan beat Khan Smedley's kid. Smedley, didn't he? Yeah. 
yeah. and like those two didn't like each other then. You see what I mean? Like there was a rivalry then. So that rivalry is real. Like Khan and Brook, real dislike between each other. Whereas I think with Joshua Fury, it's like, we're just doing this to make money. That's how, that's how I feel about that one. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean, yeah. Just, so I'm saying to all the people listening to this, stop retweeting the hype. Stop sharing the hype. Stop forwarding stuff to Russ about the Joshua, Joshua and stuff like that. Joshua, all, the, Joshua Fury. all of it. Yeah. All of it. Stop all of it. Stop all of it. Don't get involved in any of it, and you will force these guys to make real fights. Stop paying for stuff you don't want to watch, and you'll force these guys to make real fights. I promise to God. Yeah, this is what we're saying to all you Porky followers. Don't buy any more pay-per-views. Don't buy them. Stream it on VIPbox.com for free. Don't buy any, and eventually the numbers will drop, and then they'll have to make the big fights that we want. It's no good complaining to me and then putting your tongue two foot up Eddie's arsehole. That's no good. What you've got to do is refuse to pay. Don't pay your Sky subscriptions. Don't pay the pay-per-view. Go on VIP box. That's what I'd call Because what happens, Russ, is a lot of people play all sides in this. And this is what I don't respect in people. So a guy will come up to you and they'll be like, you know what, Russ? This matchroom show is utter bollocks. Yada, 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 yada. And then Hearn will tweet something and they'll reply with, yes, yeah, spot on, Eddie, you're right. And they just play all sides in this situation. And I'm like, you guys have no principle. You yeah. have no principle. You're just there playing all sides, you know? It's, it's the stuff that annoys me. I know. All right, then. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure. I'm Great. now going to watch. I've got my kids here. I'm now going to watch. I can't decide whether to watch White Heat, Public the Public Enemy, Angels with Dirty Faces, or the Roaring Twenties, all James Cagney box set. So I'm going to have some fun now with a few beers. And chill out. It's a Sunday afternoon, and I'll be working tomorrow. Sunday afternoon in the pig pen. In the pig pen. It's a Sunday afternoon. I'll be in my office tomorrow. It's Monday, bank holiday. I'm going to do Helmets of the Month tomorrow. There's, I think there's... I think I'm going to do a top 30 because it's an international helmet. So I'm going to film that tomorrow, then send it off to the tech guy to get jazzed up with inserts. And I'm going to do another couple of other videos as well. So it's going to be a grafting on a bank holiday tomorrow, but chilling today. But I've had my pal on Zoom today, Terry. I hope you and your family are all, all well down there, down the smoke. Where, there's, smoke. where If I ever go down there again, I'll never drive. I will never drive down there again, ever again in my life. It's the most expensive thing I've ever... You're paying to be in traffic jams. I now know why you all use tube. <laughs> I mean, taxis, right? You get a taxi, they want 100, 100 quid like Stig to take your 10 mile. But that's the going yeah, rate, isn't it? Yeah, mate. Just trains and tubes everywhere. It's just easy. Have you got an all-day saver, Terry, on tube? Uh, I pay monthly. And, and you can go anywhere in London where you pass? You mind, yeah. Is that on the bus and the tube? Oh, do you know, actually, Russ, I tell, I'm telling a lie. Now that we've had the lockdown, I don't have to be in the office as much. I just pay as I go. So Are you working from home then, Terry, now then, basically? Hmm? Are you working from home a lot? Uh, yeah, but sometimes I've got to be in the office, so I split it 50-50. And are you happy with that? Yeah, it's all right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a better balance than I had before. All right, then. No problem, then. All right, then. Well, listen, peace out. Thank you for coming on, Terry. And I will speak to you later or tomorrow. Don't have nightmares, people. Don't have nightmares, <laughs> Terry. You had to get that in, didn't you? To nick me live. I, lo I love that one. Don't have nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. Peace out, pal. You too. All right, pal. Take care. Bye. 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 Well... That were my uh, good friend Terry Chapandama from London. I think originally he's from Zimbabwe, Terry, where Derek Chisora is from, I think. I'm not sure. But he's a nice kid. I like him. I like Rico. Rico, I start the channel. I hope he's all right. I need to get Rico on Zoom. I need to get Matt Skelton from Essex. He's right corner from Eddie Earn on. Not Matt Skelton, the boxer. Matt Skelton, the cabbie. There's another cabbie like Stig. 
need to get Matt on. I need to get uh, Big V on. We need to get you on Big V as well. Uh, I think I'll get Mark Tibbs on. We've got a lot on at the moment, but we'll get Mark Tibbs on or I might go see him. So it's all good, po positive stuff. All right. So it's been a pleasure. The time is half five, nearly. I don't think I'll put this out now because it wouldn't be fair because it's going to take, it'd be seven o'clock before it goes out and it's well over an hour, isn't it? We have a look, yeah. Have a look. Two hours. So it wouldn't be fair for asylum lads, would it? Boxing asylum lads. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to schedule it for, when does asylum finish? About 10 o'clock. Let me just text Steve Wellens. We'll text Steve Wellens because we don't want to take them lads thunder, do we? Because they're uh, quite like him, actually. They're on asylum. You're all right. How do you spell Steve Wellens? That's S, isn't it? S. We don't want to be treading, treading on their toes. I'll have Tommy Allen coming around and setting about me. Big Tommy. A good bloke, Tom. Steve, I've got a two-hour video here. Uh, can you let me know roughly what time your asylum finishes about tonight? Can you finish it for 10 or quarter past? Let me know. What I'll do, I'll schedule it for quarter past 10. Well, let me know if you're going to go all half 10 and I'll change it. But I'll be listening anyway, I think. So I'm going to watch a video now, but... All right, Steve, let me know what time you want to finish uh, Asylum tonight and I'll schedule this two-hour blast I've just done with uh, Terry. All right. Cheers, mate. All right. Yeah, I think we'll put it on after Asylum and then people don't have to look at my ugly mug, do they? They can just turn it on and drift off listening to Terry because Terry's voice, it's soothing, isn't it? Whereas you get mine, I'm a bit like that, aren't I? All right, so peace out. Keep on trucking. Keep sporting boxing. I want to give a big shout out as well to Innovation Alloys. Thank you for backing me. South Yorkshire Packaging and Services UK Limited. Robert Lacoste, cheers for t-shirts. I would like some tracksuits though, if you don't mind. Uh, is that cheeky, Rob? I apologise if it is, but I am cheeky. And Emily at Watchfinder. All right, I think that's about it, isn't it, really? What's the other one? There's another one. Oh, Edlington Motors. Doing my merc tomorrow. Brembo brakes, discs and pads all round. Thank you very much. So, all right. So, peace out. Turn this off.